Thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you to Enzian Theater for uh, bringing me out and inviting me out today. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, and I've, my first time here, and I really like, like the venue, and uh, I hope to come out and, and watch a bunch of the other science on screen ones as well. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, I wasn't sure what the audience is going to be like, so I put together a pretty basic level presentation. Um, we can dive into any topic as deep as we want, or I can talk as long or as little as you guys like, because uh, I know you want to see the movie. Um, so real quick, um, today we'll be talking about the science of sores. Can you guys hear me okay? Is it better without? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so real quick, uh, here's a quick agenda. We'll do a little bit about me uh, and then dive into the sword stuff right away. So about me, as you mentioned, um, my actual job is I'm an aerospace mechanical engineer and analyst. Uh, actually, I don't work directly for NASA. I work for one of NASA's um, uh, contractors. I work for Honeywell Space Systems based in Clearwater, Florida. And uh, so my normal job is I, I work on all the space products, all the future products, Mars rovers, uh, rockets, uh, you know, the new Orion capsule that we'll be launching soon. Uh, that's my main job. Um, but my side job and a hobby and passion that I've always had is uh, swords and armor. Um, and it's Hollywood and films that got me into it in the first place and uh, got me into studying it. And uh, so I like to think that my real job is a little bit of the future, and my hobbies are a little bit of the past. So I try to keep myself as rounded as possible. Um, so in terms of swords, uh, I have been uh, studying and, and researching swords for about 23 years, and I've been making them for about 20. Um, I dove into swords and armor first, um, again, <laughs> because of movies, right? Conan and Highlander and all those uh, shows in the 80s. Uh, and then when I got into martial arts at a young age, uh, I, I always was attracted to learning the arts of the swords and, uh, you know, and pra practicing all sorts of arts with swords and also learning how they're actually made. Um, so yeah, that's my history on swords. So when we talk about the science of swords, first First, we have to look at what is a sword, right? Uh, at a very base level, a sword is just a piece of metal that you have in your hand, and uh, you swing it at somebody. Um, according to Webster's, uh, we have a couple different definitions. Uh, one is a weapon uh, with a long blade for cutting and thrusting that is often used as a symbol of honor and authority. That's probably the one that we're going to focus on here. Uh, there's a couple other definitions there, um, but number one is the one we're looking at. Um, so, the parts of a sword, so you have a blade, obviously, a guard, a grip, and a pommel. Let me get this thing working here, there we go. So, also when you think of what is a sword, uh, there, there's so many different types of things that actually classify as a sword and what it is and, and how it's used. And uh, so there are numerous amounts, uh, types of swords from all different functions. Uh, in the history of you know of our Earth, so every single population and every single culture has developed some sort of sword or type of sword that they have in their history. Um, so I think most of what we know today from swords, or what we think we know from about swords, is from Hollywood. And as much as I love Hollywood for bringing uh, swords and armor into focus. Uh, and making everyone more aware of them, they also do a horrible job at, at telling you what it really is. So there's a ton of misconceptions out there uh, from movies and stories and games, and, and uh, they really make me scratch my head. So let's go over a couple of those. I'm sure you guys can add to these. Uh, so let's get these out up front. So uh, I, me being a huge fan of Conan and Highlander as a kid, I thought swords were... Invincible and indestructible and could defy physics. <laughs> uh, sadly, that isn't the case. So in, in the real world, uh, swords, uh, they can't defy physics. Uh, they, they absolutely aren't indestructible, nor are they in, invincible. Sadly, I wish they were. Um, it'd make my life easier as, you know, when I make these, I don't have to repair them if they're indestructible. Um, there's also some interesting, you know, movies and stuff that where it shows a sword can slice an, an infinite line, where it cuts something and then you don't see the cut, and then 
you know, whatever it cuts slides off. Yeah, that, that doesn't really happen. Um, swords are not magic. Um, if you watch, uh, well, all sorts of films, right? Uh, Kill Bill, or you see swords cutting other swords. That, it just doesn't happen. Uh, a sword can break another sword, yes, but it's not going to slice another piece of metal. Um, here's, and the, the last few here are, are some that are halfway truth, halfway fiction, depending on where you're at. Um, so the biggest misconceptions in terms of making, and, I, and this actually is still in the industry, most people in the in industry still have a lot of these, these misconceptions, um, but the, the idea that a sword has to be forged or folded to get the best properties in the steel, that actually is not true, um, but many people in the industry believe that. Uh, so that is only true depending on your source material, right? So I'll, I'll dive into that uh, when we talk about sword materials in a few slides. But that is not an overall truth. Um, and there's a couple other ones. So one, another myth is that one sword type, uh, when, when I say this, most people say katana. They, they, uh, there is a misconception that that is a dominant style of sword compared to any other sword. Uh, and again, that's not true. Uh, that will depend on a lot of variables. And we'll discuss that when, it, when we talk about sword usage uh, in a few slides. And some other misconceptions. Uh, a lot of people think swords are heavy. Uh, no, they're not. Uh, swords are actually quite light. Of all the swords up here, I think the heaviest one is three and a half pounds. So, yeah. So this sword is uh, reconstructed off of a German blade. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty tall blade. This is one that I made based off of a piece that I held in London. And uh, you'd think this looks heavy, right? But nope, three and a half pounds. That's it. Um, so three and a half pounds, though, with a lever arm that's out a foot or so, can feel heavy, but it's really not. Um, and we'll go into that more uh, as we talk about the science behind uh, the making of these blades. So can anyone think of any other crazy outlandish things you've learned from uh, TV and movies about swords? <laughs> um, actually, believe it or not, um, uh, do you watch Mythbusters? Yeah, they actually proved that you could do that. It's just very difficult. But no, you're not going to do it by yourself. No, no one can hold a sword and do that yet, unless you're very accurate. Uh, oh, here's another one. Um, the grooves. Sorry about that. The grooves in the sword. So here's a blade that has fullers or grooves in the center of the blade. Have you heard that these allow blood to dry out faster when you stab somebody? That's not true at all. <laughs> they're, they're solely there to lighten the sword up, to take weight out. That's it. Okay. So if you think of any other fun ones, feel free to get my attention, uh, and we can go over them. Okay, let's dive into the science. So uh, as, as simple as they look, uh, there is a ton and ton and, uh, and years and years and, and centuries of, of science that goes into swords of all types. Um, if you view it as simply a piece of metal, it really misses a lot of science that dives into how these are made and, and how they're used. Um, so the very, very first thing that, uh, that is very important to the science of the sword is the materials used. Um, and the materials definitely define what makes a sword and what doesn't. Um, and, and again, this is very dependent on the age that the sword was made. So if you go back long enough, you know, swords were made from bronze um, because at the time, bronze was the hardest metal uh, that was known of. Uh, it was the most durable metal and it was the most available. Uh, there were ways to work bronze, uh, which you could not do with other metals at the time. So swords can be made from bronze then the more the iron became more readily available, and the more they learned that you can work with iron as well, then that started taking over because iron is a harder metal uh, than bronze. And then through trials and practices and honestly a scientific investigation, uh, steel uh, accidentally uh, came about. And uh, so they transitioned from iron to steel. Why? Because they learned the science behind the steel. They learned through trial and error and testing how steels can be manipulated and worked with to create a harder blade. So there's a ton of science in, in all that, and we'll dive into that 
a bit more into the how those things are actually made. Um, so shaping the material, yeah, there's two main ways, uh, there, well, there's more than two, but for the most part, there's two main ways how you can actually shape uh, the metal to form a blade. Uh, and, and the majority of this presentation will focus on the blade, by the way, not necessarily the handles. So the first way is forging. Forging is a very well-known art, and it is an art. It's, it's very much uh, a long-forgotten art for the most part, um, but it's very important in the history and the science of how these are made. Uh, through forging, um, that's how they, they learn that steel can be produced from iron. Uh, through forging, you can create various shapes and various geometries that give you certain scientific properties. Um, and back in the time, you know, they didn't have electric uh, motors and grinders and, you know, they, so the, the other methods of making blades wasn't well known of or, or known at all, right? Um, so forging was what had to be done at the time um, and people became masters of, of that and were able to forge things that we probably couldn't really reproduce today uh, just because we don't spend hours and hours forging blades every day. You know, back then they had to, so they became good at it. Uh, nowadays, we do have tools that aid the process up, so now swords can be made from machining or from grinding. And I, honestly, the, the probably the largest production of swords today is grinding. Um, basically, you start with a bare piece of metal and you grind it, uh, and that's it. Um, so as far as, as far as shaping goes, there's a lot of folks who think that forging makes a better blade than, uh, than just grinding it or shaping it with a machine. Uh, the only way that's true is based on your starting materials. So if you start with a material that is very low in carbon, per se, uh, and then you use a process in forging that increases the carbon content of the blade, then that would be correct. Um, but nowadays you can buy a piece of steel that already has the right amount of carbon, and all you have to do is shape it, and then there'll be an equal blade at the end. So it doesn't really make a difference in the end product as long as you have the right material in the first place. So different ways uh, of taking that material that you have and now turning it into what would define a sword. And that is how to actually harden the materials and to give the blade the right materials that it needs. Uh, so for bronze, if, you go, if we go all the way back to the Bronze Age sword, uh, swords, they harden their bronze by what we call work hardening. I'm not sure who in here is, uh, has any sort of metallurgy or engineering background. Anybody? Oh, okay. Well, hopefully you're learning a lot today then. So work hardening. So work hardening is, uh, and this works with bronze but not with other metals, is the more you hammer it and the more you, you move the material, plastically deform the material, the harder that material gets. And there are other metals that can do it, but bronze and the, the types of bronze they had in the Bronze Age happened to exhibit these properties the best, which is why they use bronze. So the more they hammered the steel and moved it from a block into an ingot, into a long bar, and into a blade, the, the harder that material came. So when, you're, when you actually end up with your final product, a very thin edge, uh, and you'll notice that Bronze Age blades usually have a very robust, thick rib down the center of them to keep them stiff. So that, that keeps the flexibility because that piece of bronze didn't get work hardened as much, whereas the outer edge of the sword that's pounded a lot flatter uh, gets a lot harder. So the blade is able to maintain a little bit of flexibility but also have an edge that's hard. So what do I mean by hardness? Uh, what do I mean? I'm probably saying a lot of terms that you may not uh, understand. Um, oh, wrong way. So. Again, the, the, the real, real science behind uh, the materials of the sword and the making of a sword is, in, is how you treat the metal. So there's a couple different things here. We have three main properties that we're going to talk about. Hardness, toughness, and flexibility. Hardness is the one that drives most things. So all metals, or most metals, can be either in a soft condition or a hard condition. Soft means it's able to bend if I take a piece of metal and I can just bend it and it stays bent, it means it's really soft. Uh, it, however, if I take a piece of metal and I try to bend it and it doesn't and it actually just cracks and shatters, that means it's very hard. So in the Bronze Age, the more you pound out that 
flat edge, it'll get to a point where it'll chip off because it has become so hard that it turns it almost into like a piece of glass. So when you think of hardness, think of oh, on one side of the scale, you have a piece of glass, extremely hard but very brittle. On the other side, you have a rubber band, very soft and very flexible uh, and also bendable. Okay. Um, so when it comes to steel blades, this is now done not through work hardening, but through heat treating. So when you heat treat a blade, uh, you might have seen in movies where they quench or uh, dip a blade into water or into ice or into whatever. That's actually taking a hot blade and then freezing it at a molecular level. The steel. Obviously that doesn't work well for a sword, right? So they learned that you don't want to just get quench a blade, but then you got to do some heat treatment to remove the heat, uh, or I mean remove the, the temper back a little bit. That's what the temper phase is. So quench and temper, if you've ever heard that before, means quench it in water, make the blade heat it back up again, but not as much to draw some of that hardness back out. So that adds the attribute of toughness. So toughness means the ability to stay hard, but also keep a little bit of flexibility in there. So swords, um, and the swords I'll focus on are ones that I personally have uh, a lot of research on through, through my visits to London or, or Paris or wherever, where I've got a chance to hold some original ones. There's some in St. Augustine too, which is great. Um, and swords attribute great qualities, right? So you can take a blade and you can bend it like crazy. So and they pop right back. They're very flexible, and they need to be able to maintain that flexibility, um, but also have a high amount of strength and edge hardness to do what they need to do. Um, they're not just a, a simple piece of metal. So there's a lot of science behind the materials and, and how these blades are made and, and how they are and why they are what they are. <clears throat> so the, if there's a takeaway on this slide, I would say that what really makes a sword a real blade is, is how well and uh, it, the blade's actually heat treated and if it's heat treated at all. So, so uh, aside from materials, uh, design of the sword uh, is also very, very important. There's a lot of science behind the design of the sword. Uh, again, from a very basic design, it's, it's just a large cutting or thrusting blade uh, meant to be used by a person. Now that's key. <laughs> meant to be used by a person, which means it can't be 25 pounds. Uh, it has to be light and be able to be used. Um, keep in mind, when these were actually used in the, during the times that they had to be worn every day, um, you know, people had to be comfortable having something on their side that's three foot long or more and be able to move around in daily conversations and, and not have it be an issue. So if you had a thing that's 20 pounds on your hip all day long, that would not be comfortable. Um, so blades are, you know, they're meant to be uh, used by people, so they're very light. Uh, they also must be able to withstand, you know, combat, but also, may, you know, must be able to hold a, an edge for cutting. So those two things sometimes contradict, right, because what, what makes a good edge is how hard the edge is, but the, the harder it gets, the more brittle it gets, right? So if it's brittle, then it's not good for combat. So there's always a balance there, and again, depending on the the culture you're in, that, that balance may be a little different. So for the Japanese blades, they, the edges they get and the, the way they construct their blades make the edge of their katanas very hard. Uh, so the, the hardness levels are measure, measured in what we call Rockwell hardness. So if you were to take a katana, the Rockwell hardness of the edge is usually up in the fi fi like high 50s, 55, 56, 57, all the way up to the the mid 60s, 65 is probably, the, maybe 67 is probably the hardest edge of an original katana that I've ever seen. It's very hard. But the back of the katana um, is very soft. So its hardness is probably down in the 30s. And that means the back is very soft and the majority of the blade is very soft, but the, the front edge is very, very, very hard and can keep a hard edge. Now, is, is that the best sword design? For their culture, it was. Um, the, the swords themselves, uh, because of the nature of their construction, aren't flexible. So if you take a hard hit on a katana, odds are that's the last time you're going to use that katana because the next time you use it, it'll break. So again, it, it highly depends on how the culture was made and how they were used. 
Um, ten? Okay. Again, cut me off if I'm going too long. Um, the other thing is swords must be ergonomical. That sounds simple, right? It's a sword. It's a handle and a blade, right? That, that can't be that difficult, right? So how can this be not er ergonomical? So there's a couple of things that we forget about and we don't really know because we don't actually have to use these every day, right? So there's a few things that are pretty neat. First thing in my, all my research, and, and uh, these are findings of also other folks who've studied swords for quite a while, and um, uh, really dove into how swords work and how they work. There, there's a lot of science in how the ergonomics of the sword works in terms of how a sword interacts with the person. So I find these pretty interesting, and I've also found these facts to be true on every single historical piece I've held, which I find quite astounding. So first thing is, watch the vibration of the sword. So there are two points of vibration there, right? So one part where it doesn't move, another part where it doesn't move. Right? You guys see that? So the two what we call nodes of vibration are the points where the blades don't vibrate. So when you hit an object, where do you want those nodes of vibration to be? Well, the one in the handle should be right in your hand, right? And historically, they knew this, and they put this into every sword design you see. So when you hit something with a blade, when it vibrates, the point of no vibration or minimal vibration is in my hand. So a good way to know if, there's a, if a reproduction of a sword is authentic or not is give it a vibration test. Uh, so again, one more time, watch my hand. Yeah, there's really nothing right here compared to the big vibration you have right here. So again, that, that's not an easy thing to do. When you make a blade, and I've made hundreds of blades, that's actually very difficult to get the note of vibration right into the center where your grip would be. And again, that that is on almost every single historical piece, no matter where it's from. If it's Japan or Europe or Turkey or Egypt, they all produce the same effect, which is very neat. If you were to pick up a modern sword made by a modern smith, that actually rarely happens. So it's a, a piece of science that I find pretty interesting. Um, the other idea behind the science of the ergonomics of the sword is how the sword works, in terms of how it falls in the hand. So. There's something what we call, um, and it's different uh, researchers call it different things, but uh, I like that they call it the rotation of the blade. So basically what this means is when I'm holding the sword and I move it just by myself here, there's a point on that sword which doesn't move. And for a long sword such as this that is used with two hands, you'll find historically that any two-handed sword the point of rotation of the blade is down at the tip, very near the tip of the blade. And the reason for that is how the blade is used. So no matter how I move the blade, the tip remains pretty close, right? So it, the tip is always on point. It looks like I can magically keep that tip on point, but in reality I'm not. It's just how the sword is made to move around a handle. Um, for a single hand sword, such as this one over here, that point of rotation is higher up the blade and more about uh, where you would rotate it to cut. Right? So now it's not easier to move with two hands, it's easier to move with one hand. Um, and just, just the nature of how these are made and the science behind them shows that they really put a lot of thought in the ergonomics and how the blades actually use and react to human movement. So it's a very neat topic and, and it's a topic that not many Smiths really know about just because, again, we don't have people using these every day. We don't have soldiers coming back to the field saying, hey, this felt this way. I need you to adjust this. You know, I need it to feel this way. Uh, so there is, again, a lot of science behind that in the making and, and how they're used. So on from design into function. So this is uh, uh, really where uh, a lot of Hollywood and a, a lot of movies and games really mess up. Um, but, you know, we forgive them because they, they brought us into this field in the first place. So, <laughs> sword design, 
it always evolves as the armor evolves of, of any culture or any time. So if you look at a sword, what is it? It's a tool of war. Uh, it's a tool of self-defense. It, it's a tool to uh, attack and defend, right? So when swords were begun development, you know, they, they first were designed to be used against unarmored people because armor didn't really exist yet. And therefore the blade didn't have to be as tough. It didn't have to cut through tougher materials. It all had to do was cut through skin. And if you ever cut yourself cooking or anything else, cutting through skin is pretty easy. Uh, so the sword designs at the time were not designed to beat armor. They weren't designed to beat other types of weapons. They, were, they had one focus and one design. Now as armor developed, you can see the, the differences in sword design evolve, which I think is pretty neat in, in itself. And this is another reason why you can't look at a katana and say it's a better sword than a long sword. It's not. It depends on the use, the time, and the function of the blade itself. So we have all sorts of uh, blades from all throughout time that have different functions, and this is why they look different. Uh, I mean, there's also, there's also a cultural impact in terms of what makes a sword look different than another. But the main thing is the use. So a lot of older swords are designed for cutting, um, again, because armor especially plate armor and metal armor and chain uh, armor wasn't uh, as prevalent. So swords made for cutting look uh, wider, they look flatter, uh, they're a lot more flexible. Uh, if you look at Viking blades or much older European blades, they're very wide, they don't really have a, a, a point to them um, because they're meant for cutting. Now as armor developed, they realized, well, uh, I can't really cut as well through thick leather or through chain, but I can stab pretty well, and that's, that stabbing is, is uh, now a more functional uh, way to take my opponent down, either by breaking through the armor or breaking through the chains. So you'll see uh, blades evolve from a wide flat blade to a more triangular, more pointed tip blade. Uh, and that's in Western culture in Japan. Um, they, the way they developed armor was far different. They never got into plates, they didn't do plate armor. They did silks and they did other types of leathers and stuff. So the cutting katana constantly changed. Originally, katanas were very straight. Uh, and then as, uh, as they learn more science and they learn more technologies, and, and also Japan is great from borrowing technologies from other countries, uh, especially ones that invaded them. So as the Chinese invaded, uh, Japan, they took the Chinese weapons of the time, which were a bit more curved, they had a bit different science behind them and how they were made, and they learned that. Um, and then their armor developed to be able to withstand more cuts. And so you'll notice the katana is a, it's a decent blend between a cutting blade, but also very stiff to be a thrusting blade. Now at the same time in Europe, uh, you'll have the same style of blade where it's a, you'll see, and this is a good example of it, the blade is slightly curved on each edge, but it also comes to a very, very cute point for stabbing. So that's, and they're oftentimes two-handed, not always. Um, and that mainly is to, again, get around the armor of the time. So the armor of the time, when those were developed, was plate armor. So how, and this is where a knight's tail comes in, because this is what's being used in a knight's tail. Two-handed sword, pretty pointy. Uh, and basically the design is to try to get through the armor of the time, which was plate armor. You can't cut plate armor, and no sword will do that, uh, but you can try to use the point to get into the crevices and the joints between the armor, and that's why the swords were designed the way they were. Um, so, five minutes? Okay. So we'll take questions in a second, but, um, so I hope you can see there, there's a lot of science behind all different functions, whether it's materials, whether it's the, the design of the blade, whether it's the function of the blade, there is a ton and ton and ton of science that dives into all these, and I've only touched the surface on everything here. Um, so if you have any further questions or if you have any uh, things you, you would like to talk about, if you're as interested in swords as much as I am, I know I'm probably way nerding out on this stuff, um, but if you'd like to join me in that, please uh, you know, feel free to come talk to me. Um, Again, I have just time for a couple of minutes, but I'm going to start, Chris. There are a couple of yep. swords over there that you haven't touched upon. If you could just briefly go through a, a two or three more. Of sure, what they sure. Are. Absolutely. So starting uh, with the oldest, so, and I kind of laid these out with the plan, and I totally forgot the plan. <laughs> so um, starting with the oldest, so this is a single-hand broadsword. 
Uh, usually this would be around, that. well, this could go from the 10 hundreds in Europe all the way up to probably the 15 hundreds, 16 hundreds. Um, the sword, this single-handed broadsword didn't change that much over time. Uh, the big things that changed are what I talked about, either flat and wide or more triangular and pointy. So those are the big differences. And you can track that through time along with the armor development uh, side by side. Um, this sword, the one I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's a German uh, blade. Uh, this one was, uh, there's a similar version of it in um, the Tower of London and in, uh, I'm trying to remember, the Wallace Collection. The Wallace Collection, if you ever get to England and London, if you get a chance to visit the Wallace Collection, is the most beautiful collection I've ever seen. Probably the biggest in the world. Um, but this sword is, is, I don't know if you can tell, it's a single-edged sword, so it's much like a katana, but it's a long curved blade. And uh, it was basically a, a design where there's, there's two, when, when you have a double-edged blade versus a single-edged blade, there's a couple things. So if you have a double-edged blade, it's usually a little stiffer because the spine of the blade is a little thicker. So back then, the discussion was, well, is a double-edged blade more efficient or is a single-edged blade more efficient? A single-edged blade, you can have a much shallower taper to an edge, whereas a double-edged blade, right, you have about twice the angle because you only have half the blade to use to taper down to an edge. So it was a combination of things back then. So a lot of cultures used both single edge and double edge blades. So that wasn't, single edge blades weren't unique to Japan or China. Uh, then later on in history, we have the rapier. So looking at the shape of this blade, what was the purpose of this blade initially? Yeah, stab, 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 stab. Now, historical rapiers you can cut with as well, but the main purpose of the rapier was, well, everyone's running around in plate armor. How do we get through that? Well, we're gonna have to stab through that. So cutting became almost obsolete. It wasn't obsolete entirely, but it became obsolete. Um, and then the other, the other ideas behind what drove the rapier function is now that you're stabbing more and you're reaching out more, obviously your hand is more exposed, right? So then they started developing uh, ways to cover the hand so that when you're stabbed, you're protected. Uh, on top of that, uh, there, there's also a misconception that rapiers are lighter than other swords. In reality, they're not. They're about the same weight. Um, this is still a rapier of about the 1600s, maybe late 1500s. Now, the, the further you go on to the late 1600s, early 1700s, this does change because armor then... Once you're being stabbed all the time, what happens to the armor? Well, they stop wearing it, right? <laughs> because, well, it's not working. Also, the, what also contributed to the end of armor? Firearms, right? So when firearms came around, armor became obsolete. Um, but those who were developing the blades had forgotten that if you're fighting an, you know, this is hundreds of years later, but they forgot that if you're fighting an unarmed opponent or an unarmored opponent, um, cutting is very effective, and you would, you would want a flatter, longer blade. So then what really developed from that? The saber came about later on, right? Uh, it's, it's still light and long like a rapier, but it's flatter and more of a cutting blade. So there, there's a lot of history there and a lot of science. Uh, have I missed any blades? I think that's it. Any other questions? We have time for one or two questions. I'm sorry, I can't see everybody. I'll, I'll do it here. Right. <laughs> Lay it down here in front. So, uh, part of it, I think, is a lot of land. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Right. It was actually very common. Uh, so even historically, they knew. So. Uh, so in a knight's tale, think of what it is. A knight's tale, and I love it, uh, but it's about jousting in a tournament, right? So jousting for war, your lance would be completely different. Uh, jousting in a tournament, even in that time, the lances were made with pine instead of oak uh, or instead of other harder woods because they knew pine breaks really easily, it shatters very easily. Um, the metal end cap you were talking about was made from a, a cast metal and those are very, they're very brittle when you cast metal. So breaking away stuff like that, that's actually quite simple to do. And it was very, I wouldn't say that particular thing was historically accurate, but it could have been done easily. Um, one of the other things, by the way, I liked about A Knight's Tale is they do go into some of the science, although they focus more on the jousting and the armor. Uh, 
Um, he does do a little bit of the sword stuff, and he is right. Jousting was much more prevalent and much more, uh, what's the word for it, prestigious than, than winning with the longsword. Um, but I wish they would have dove into the longsword bits a little bit more. The way they show it on here isn't accurate. Uh, you know, historically, people aren't going at each other in tournaments trying to beat each other down. That's not, it was more of a point system, um, the way it worked, just like a, a tournament today for martial arts. Um, so obviously if you're hitting somebody with armor with a sword and it's not going to hurt them. And in the movie it shows like, oh, it hurts. No, it doesn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> so um, so it, I like that they go into that. They also go into uh, the armor, the female armor is fantastic. She's one of my favorite characters. And she goes into a, a point where she learns a better heat treatment for the steel. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. That's how it worked. So I, I'm glad that they threw that in there. One final question. That's, yes, sir. Um, a lot of us heard about Larry Hill. Obviously, the real life story is that he's massive. Right. Chris, could you repeat the question? So that right. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Okay. So the question was Damascus, um, uh, similar to the Game of Thrones. What do they call it? What do they call it? Valerian Steel. There you go. Uh, is Damascus a, a real thing, or how much of that is fiction, how much is true? Um, believe it or not, uh, Damascus Steel is, uh, in the way it was done, we, we have been able to recreate it. We know what, how they did it and what they did it. And basically, it's, they got lucky. They got really lucky. Um, it is not a, uh, an unrealistic thing, and, and the, basically the way Damascus works is they had the right amount of vanadium and chromium in the metals. So when it goes through the right heat tree process, which is an intense heat treat process of heat back and forth, back and forth. What it does is the, the bands of vanadium and chromium start separating out in the steel. And when they start separating out in the steel, they create hard bands of metal. Um, so there's actually two different types of Damascus. The one I was just talking about was the actual original, what they considered Damascus. The other, there's another way to make the blade look exactly the same, where it looks like tree bark. Um, but it's not through heat treat. Um, the other way is to fold different types of metals together on top of one another, which gives you layers of hard, layers of soft, layers of hard. Um, but uh, Damascus is real. It's, it's not something that is beyond science. Um, and it's, it's also not as, there's, I think there's stories of Damascus blades cutting gun barrels off. Right? That's, they weren't cutting gun barrels off, they were breaking them off. And you could do that with any of these swords here if you hit it hard enough. Um, so it wasn't something that was magical for Damascus. So there is a lot of truth and fiction to that. Thank you, Chris. Um, the good news is that um, Chris will be staying around after yep. the film, and you can ask him questions outside uh, at Eden Bar. And so, Chris, we thank you very much for being here. Thank Very you. enlightening. Mr. Chris Fields, please. Thank you.